the 27th. This is, um, this is right after Sigurd has slain uh, Fafnir and he's made kind of a realization in all of this and that, you know, he's, he's kind of figured out that he's fought a dragon that wasn't his dragon to fight to begin with. He's jumped in there like John Wayne and, uh, <laughs> killed this dragon and this dragon has asked him some serious questions and pointed out that we're all wearing masks. We're all wearing a mask that, that creates what we think is a helm of awe to the rest of the world. We're all trying to put on some kind of show or display of force to protect us uh, or that which we want to protect. Walking around with the false bravado or superior intellect or any of these things that we see randomly or routinely rather paraded out through Ossetru as Hey, I'm comfortable with my faith. Don't mess with me. Um, and it's it, and he kind of points that out. But in the meantime, in that realization, Sigurd comes to this this kind of courageous this demonstration of courage. This courageous realization that yes, I stood here and did it. I need to stand here like a man and tell him who I am. So first, he wasn't going to do it. Now he's done it, and now we get to this point of Reagan. And the whole point of this story for me is this: Reagan has been this. This uh, supposedly, you know, badass, skilled and magic warrior uh, with might and wisdom and more ingenious than other men. And at every time that it comes to uh, a crossroads where there might need to be a demonstration of that courage, we find him quaking in his boots or not ready to engage or any of these other things. The entire premise of the story is that Reagan couldn't do what needed to be done with regards to his brother. So he gets someone else to do it. He gets someone young and gullible to buy into this load of horseshit of him being a victim and uh, gets him to take action for him, much in the same manner that Loki stands at the edge of the crowd and grabs a hold of, you know, the, the wounded and the disenfranchised and blows a little sunshine up his ass and says, okay, take a shot. And uh, that is something that happens far too often with regards to people that seek out a new spirituality. They come into, into this way of life and someone points them in this direction or tells them to source this or you need to read this. And yes, all of it needs to be read. All of it needs to be looked at, but we're not reenacting here. We're building a faith. And sometimes that faith means reading a little bit between the lines. In stanza 26, Sigurd spake, Afar didst thou go while Fafnir reddened with his blood my blade so keen. With the might of the dragon my strength I matched while thou in the heather didst hide. Reagan spake, Longer wouldst thou in the heather have let Yon hoary giant hide had the weapon availed not that once I forged the keen edged blade thou didst bear. So Reagan's trying to take credit for this success. Now Reagan provided this tutelage for Sigurd to, to, to forge this sword. He was given the fragments of his father's sword by Odin. Reagan's trying to take credit saying, Hey, I made that for you. But Sigurd's got, he's got a real good point here. Better is heart than a mighty blade. For him who shall fiercely fight. The brave man well shall fight and win, though dull his blade may be. When I was 16 years old, I wasn't as big as I am now by any stretch of the imagination. And I'll never forget a man that I knew who was pretty much an outlaw. He said, don't ever back down from anybody, Brian. He said, it's all a matter of how much heart you got. You know, I've seen fighters get in the ring that, that uh, it takes a lot of heart just to take that first step. And that heart is usually based on the confidence they have with the training they've put into it with everything they've done. But these, and the same thing with soldiers, they do all this training, but when the rubber really meets the road, those guys that win the medal of honor or the Victoria or the Navy cross or the soldier's medal, these are not the gigantic Conan style style of men. These are men that have the heart. They have the heart that cares for something greater than themselves or someone else. Those are the people that win in life. A brave men better than cowards be when the clash of battle comes and better the glad than the gloomy man shall face what before him lies. You know, that's pretty, that's almost right out of the how have them all. You know, the, the lives of the bold and courageous are best are the best. You know, the, uh, the brave man is going to take care of those things that are in front of him. And with regards to this faith that we have today, sometimes that might mean getting rid of some of those ideas that may not necessarily be congruent with our ability to move this idea forward or create for us a life that we expect when we became also true, when we decided to change the spiritual foundation of our lives. It's real easy to find yourself at the outskirts of society, at the fringe element, 
and start pointing a finger at all of the negative things we see, which, which might be destroying our society. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, our society's always been changing. The world never stops changing. And we can sit here and apply our wit and what we perceive as our intelligence or our heart and point out all of these failings. We might even make a flyer and post it up all over town because some heavy woman fell in love with a black guy and we don't like it. Well, the fact of the matter is nobody really cares if we like it or don't like it. What society is looking for for these people that decide they wanted to jump up like Arnold Schwarzenegger and say, hey, I found a new faith. I can outthink all of you is are you still going to be worth your salt? Are you still going to be a good neighbor? Are you still going to be able to hold a job and pay your bills? Are you still going to be somebody worth knowing? Or are you going to constantly be talking about some kind of conspiracy that you think you understand? I posed the question to a couple of people now. Jason's one of them. Tell me the one person that you know that is enjoying success at a level that's above what the rest of the society is enjoying because they decided to follow these principles. And let me tell you something, that's a real short list. But I can assure you of one thing, 100% of the people that are enjoying that success are not people that are spending all of their time making flyers about what they don't like in society, some perceived wrong. They do not consider which way Western man to be the highlight or the culmination of, of Western literature. But be that as it may, this is kind of the point where Sigurd stands up and realizes, hey, all of this nonsense that I've been taught may not necessarily be what moves me forward, but that's a real painful realization to make when you come across the idea that all of this stuff that the church, your job, your friends, your parents, the people you love have told you might not be the thing that's going to move you forward in this world. It might be just the thing that's going to keep you average, just like them. There's a real interesting dichotomy that happens when people begin to move forward or beyond everyone else. And it's real bad when they decide, well, I don't want to be Christian. I'm going to do this. My success is going to go way beyond all that. When we let go of some of those shackles, it's painful for the people that are going through it. And it takes courage to be honest about it. It's also painful for the people around you. Because now all of a sudden they're really faced with the limitations of what they've decided to accept as the role model for their own life. But stanza 30, thy read it was that I should ride hither over mountains high. The glittering worm would have wealth and life if thou hadst not mocked at my might. Then Reagan went up to Fafnir and cut out his heart with his sword that was named Rithiel. And then he drank blood from the wounds. Reagan said, sit now, Sigurd, for sleep, I, sleep will I. Hold Fafnir's heart to the fire, for all his heart shall be eaten, since deep of blood I have drunk. So he lays out this task for him. He points out, Sigurd points out, said, listen here, you got me on this long journey. You drug me through all of this nonsense. You've made fun of me this whole time. You've agged me on, nagged at me, pushed at me, motivated me, um, got me to buy into this victim mentality that you're your parents did you wrong and you, you should have some of that treasure and the part of the great part of society should be yours, blah, blah, blah. And now this, he's gone over this high mountain, engaged in this journey and killed this great worm. But that worm would still be alive and have wealth and life. But Reagan has made so much fun of him, has egged him on, has antagonized him with, well, you owe me this. I've seen many mothers and fathers say that very kind of thing to their children. Well, you really kind of owe me this. I mean, you know, you wouldn't have what you have if I hadn't have done this for you. You wouldn't be where you are if I hadn't have made that sacrifice of working a double shift or two jobs, blah, blah, blah. You see, all they're doing right there, that's a real painful realization, too, is that the mother or the father that's kind of pointing that out to their child is ensuring that that's the level of success they will have in their life. They will never go above or beyond that. They will accept that. They will adopt that. They are taught that from a very early age, and that's how they're going to live. They're going to be members of a union. They're going to work a nine to five out of the hundred men, 95 of them. That's the 95 work their average, work a day, everyday life, and that's as far as they'll ever be, and they might have a happy time when their kids come over, and it's just average. And their parents taught them how to do that. If their parents hadn't said these things, maybe they could have 
done something different. Maybe they could have explored new horizons without fear of recrimination. And Sigurd is pointing out that all this nonsense you've told me has cost this life of this other creature that had nothing to do with me. Reagan said that he doesn't pay any attention to it. Cook the heart. Let's go on about our business. Sigurd took Fafnir's heart and cooked it on a spit. While he thought, when he thought that it was fully cooked and the blood foamed out of the heart, then he tried it with his finger to see whether it was fully cooked. He burned his finger and put it in his mouth, but when Fafnir's heart blood came on his tongue, he understood the speech of the birds. He heard nuthatches chattering in the thickets, and a nuthat said, There sits Sigurd, sprinkled with blood, and Fafnir's heart with fire he cooks. Wise were the breaker of rings, I ween, to eat the life muscles all so bright. A second spake, There Reagan lies, and plans he lays, the youth to betray who trusts him well. Lying words with wiles will he speak till his brother, the maker of mischief, avenges. A third spake, less by a head than the chatterer hoary go from here to hell. Then all of the wealth he alone can wield, the gold that Fafnir guarded. So there's a real interesting thing going on here. These, this understanding the language of the birds is something that caught my mind, caught my eye a while back. And I spoke with Everett about it before I wrote um, Life and the Love of Life, or maybe it was Blind in One Eye. That that understanding of the language of birds is a is a concept that's repeated in all kinds of mythologies around the world. You have Odin with Hugin and Munin, memory and thought. It's not really any accident that they are represented by birds, and they're very special birds because they're the birds that eat of the dead. Uh, they kind of, they're black. They kind of who knows what all they see. Maybe they fly between the worlds. And there's a lot that goes with that. But this understanding of the language of the birds appears in African mythologies and Middle Eastern mythologies and Native American mythologies. And it may have something to do with the idea that they understand the flows of energy across the world. If a bird hatches somewhere, let's say I get a bird egg and I hatch it, um, I can release that bird and it will find its way to its breeding grounds or nesting grounds within the year. Nobody's giving it directions. Nobody's telling this bird, hey, go over here or go over there. It understands instinctively. It perceives flows of energy. Certain foxes, the further north you go, the more sensitive they are to the magnetic fields of the earth. The language of the birds represents kind of a mysterious understanding that they might know. Who knows what they can see from that vantage point? And there's really an element of mystery there. But this blood that Sigurd that's eating this heart that he's touched, he now understands it. But he's also stood up to the teaching he's received. He's pointed out that I've taken this life of this being that had nothing to do with me. I'm making this realization that maybe you're kind of using me. When a person begins to make that realization that some of the concepts, ideas, and thoughts that they've been taught to believe are true, real, and valid, new worlds begin to open up for them, just like it was for everyone that decided to become also true. When they decided to take a look in the direction of all of those areas they were told not to look in growing up, new horizons began to appear. And it's the same thing here. Though the literature, the stanzas are, are much more beautifully written than your regular preponderous uh, explanation could ever be but he's hearing these things now. He's beginning to see, much like people becoming red-pilled or black-pilled or whatever they want to call it, he's beginning to see some of this stuff that he's been dealing with may not necessarily be good for the future of his own existence. And we're in the same boat when we come in also true. Some of those things we're beginning to look at, we're like, man, that's, that's not necessarily good for my existence. I don't want to trade all of my time for someone else's dollars. I want to experience some time some to... Uh, understand myself in the woods. I want to walk in the forest. I want to enjoy happiness with my children. Uh, how do we build wealth in that? How do we enjoy success in that? And there's a whole part of it that comes with that. Now, part of it was Reagan was going to get some of that, or Sigurd was going to get some of that treasure. So he went ahead and willingly went it. He was acting as a mercenary. Now all of a sudden he understands this guy is going to kill him because the fact of the matter is he's killed his brother. And if you kill someone's brother, you're not supposed to make friends with that person. You're supposed to take vengeance on that. Why would you make friends with your brother's killer? 
And it's the same thing with, with Loki killing Balder. Why would you make friends with your brother's killer? Why would you worship someone that stole the light of the world? This is a common concept throughout the Middle Ages, so much so that some of the first sets of laws in Gaul after, uh, oh hell, what was his name? After Charlemagne came, you conquered most of it, was he had to stop all these people killing each other because you killed my brother. When the same thing goes on today with all of the gang wars in Chicago and all of these inner cities. You know, you killed my brother. I got to go take vengeance. I got to stand up like a man. That very tribal thought process still exists in the most tribal aspects of our society and culture. Sigurd has stumbled in there with the gullibility of youth and bought into this and killed this man's brother. Now, all of a sudden, he's got to pay the piper. It is only after he begins to question the veracity of what he's been taught that he can wake up and smell the coffee. And that's exactly what's happening here. A fourth spake, wise would he seem if he would heed the counsel good we sisters give? Thought he would ever give the, and the ravens gladden. There is ever a wolf where his ears I spy. A fifth spake, less wise must be the tree of battle than to me would seem the leader of men. If forth he lets one brother fare, while he of the other the slayer, the slayer is. So that's exactly what I was just talking about. A sixth spake, most foolish he seems, if he shall spare his foe the bane of the folk. There Reagan lies, who hath wronged him so, yet falsehood knows he not. So that's part of his character. He's been a deceiver of men. He's like a politician, manipulating the crowds. He's done it on a very personal level. And we've all kind of felt that way. A seventh spake, let the head from the frost cold giant be hewed and let him of the rings be robbed. Then all the wealth which Fafner's was shall belong to thee alone. Sigurd spake, not so rich a fate shall Reagan have as the tale of my death to tell. For soon the brothers both shall die and hence to hell shall go. He figures it out. He rids himself of that poisonous thought process that has kept him from becoming what he's supposed to become. If you remember, after he takes vengeance on his father, he's for the, for the death of his father, he's kind of sitting around wondering what to do with his life, like an Olymp Olympian that's won a gold medal or an astronaut that's been into space. Well, where do I go from here? I've pretty much achieved the greatest thing I could. Now what do I do? Well, Reagan had a solution for him. But it wasn't anything that had to do with him. It was something that had to do with Reagan, Reagan alone. So now Sigurd kind of figures it out and he makes that sacrifice of what raised him like we do, like Odin did when he hung himself on the tree. He shed those parts of himself that may not necessarily have been worth carrying forward. They were a hindrance. It was like an albatross around the neck. So Reagan takes the, takes the uh, necessary action. Bind Sigurd the golden rings to get. Sigurd hewed off Reagan's head, and then he ate Fafnir's heart and drank the blood of both Reagan and Fafnir. Then Sigurd heard what the nuthatch said. Bind Sigurd the golden rings together. Not kindly it is ought to fear. I know a maid, there is none so fair. Rich in gold, if thou mightest get her. Green the paths to Giyuki lead. And his faith, the way to the wanderer shows, the doughty king a daughter has, that thou as a bride mayest Sigurd by. Another spake, a hill stands high on Hindyrfjall, all with flame is ringed without. Warriors wise did once make it once, out of the flaming light of the flood. So there's an interesting thing there as well, is that now Sigurd has shed those childish ideas that kept him as a boy, a strong boy, a competent boy, but not yet the man. So now he has shed those ideas and started to become a man. The first thing he's offered is the daughter of a king. The second thing he's offered is a real challenge. A hall stands high on Hinderfjall. All with flame is it ringed without. Warriors wise did make it once out of the flaming light of the flood. So the flaming light of the flood, this is, this is a kind of an interesting play on words in that it is referencing that what I've always suggested with the Veluspa when the stars rained down from the heaven. In a time of great change, 
something was left behind from that age, something very ancient, something very powerful, and it stands on a hall, it's ringed about with fire, so your average Joe isn't going to make it through that flame. An average Joe isn't going to be able to take to uh, handle what wise warriors made. It's something left over from ancient times that is a real treasure, is a true benefit to the man who wants to be a better man. <laughs> on the mountaintop sleeps a battle maid, and about her plays the bane of the wood, that's fire. Ig with the thorn hath smitten her thus, for she failed the fighter he fain would save. There mayest thou behold the maiden helmed, who forth on Vingscornir rode from the fight, the victory bringer, her sheep, her sleep shall not break, thou hero son, so the Norns have said. So Brunhild is laying in this as a remnant of a time gone by ancient wisdom this divine feminine represents that ancient competing complementing force the yin and the yang you will and it represents that ancient wisdom that the intensity of building a man may not always be aware of that he needs to become what he needs to become so they lay it out for him and they pretty much put a challenge in front of his face look here buddy if you think you're so such hot shit why don't you go up there and try to get some of that and it's the same thing you see in bars. You know, look, man, she's out of your league, but you can go give it a shot if you think you got what it takes. So he does. Here's a challenge. Here's a purpose. Here's something that a man might seem worth trying to do. A, a maid's hand to win, not to buy, to win, to, to, to figure out if he's worthy enough. That is the point where most men get the most confused. In that challenge of becoming worthy enough to earn the hand of a woman, the right to wed her, in a society or an age when we no longer have those powerful man-making ceremonies, when we no longer have those ideas of other men conferring masculinity upon other men, there is all too often the tendency in this stage of mind right here where men will figure, will, will wonder and ask the question of a woman, am I man enough now? That's what men are waiting for. They're waiting on a woman to tell them that they're man enough. And she's waiting on something too. Women cannot confer masculinity upon men. And men cannot confer femininity upon a woman. But this is real interesting here is that that's the very point where men become the most confused in today's world, because there's a challenge. You're going to have to grow into something. You're going to have to step up to the plate. You're going to have to be a worthwhile producer. You're going to have to be the kind of guy that produces something that will keep a home together and safeguard it. So he accepts the challenge. Now, Hindrifjall means mountain of the hind. Um, battle made Brunhild. Here clearly defined as a Valkyrie. Bane of the wood is fire. Now, Odin, when he pricks her with the sleep thorn, um, well, we'll get into that when we get to it. Sigurd rode along Fafner's trail to his lair and found it open. The gate posts were of iron and the gates of iron too were all the beams in the house, which was dug down into the earth. There Sigurd found a mighty store of gold, and he filled two chests full thereof. He took the fear helm and a golden mail coat and the sword Horati and many other precious items and loaded Granny with them. But the horse would not go forward until Sigurd mounted on his back. That's a speaking of loyalty. That's Awas. That's the teamwork of men and horse. Uh, to move this great treasure forward into the world, there's, a, there's an understanding of men working with great animals. There's a partnership there that's so very crucial to the building of the very foundations of our world. Men being able to work with ox, with horse, with hog, um, to help create those foundations of our civilization. Sigurd wants to go out into the world. He's not going to walk. He's going to ride. So there's a step above right there. When you have a horse that's so loyalty, so loyal to you, when you've created that teamwork, there's a real true essence of Awas at work there. Now, the Sigurd Riffamal, 
the ballad of the victory bringer. And that that's important in and of itself because you call this the ballad of the victory bringer. Well, he's just defeated Fafna Small and he has just made the realization he's just taken that red pill. He's just stepped away from everything he's been taught and learned and tried to understand from this being who was in no way his equal. Matter of fact, he was a short man, had a little Napoleon complex. He uh, had to use with uh, fancy words, he had to cajole Sigurth into doing something he couldn't do for himself. Kind of like David Lane driving the getaway car. He didn't pull the trigger. He just sat there and talked enough stuff till uh, he, somebody killed that Jewish radio host and he drove the getaway car. Anyways, same kind of stuff. Sigurth rode up on Hinderfjall and turned southward toward the land of the Franks. On the mountain, he saw a great light as if fire were burning and the glow reached up to heaven. And when he came thither, there stood a tower of shields and above it was a banner. This was built by wise warriors. Sigurth went into the shield tower and saw that a man lay there sleeping with all his war weapons. First, he took the helm from his head and then he saw it was a woman. The mail coat was as fast as it had been grown to the flesh. And then he cut the mail coat from the head opening downward and out to both the armholes. Then he took the mail coat from her and she awoke and sat up and saw Sigurd. In that paragraph, we find the present condition for most women in today's world. When women are challenged with being successful, with equal rights, with um, all of these things, they have to work as hard as a man. They have to make a presentation as a man. They have to act as a man. They have to do many things. Now this real man that has accomplished what it means to become a man, he has slain his dragon. He has you know, shed those childish teachings. When he comes up and is confused, these warriors wise built this thing. And most women in today's world will build a wall around their heart to protect that divine feminine within them from a world that will use beauty up in an instant and pass it around like a bomb. Now, what choice do a, does a woman in today's world have other than to protect herself? When sometimes the greatest aspect of a man might be how many women he slept with. When you're bombarded on television of, well, if you're not young and beautiful, what do you know, you're really not worth it. Um, there's all kinds of challenges that women must face. And the best thing that they can do is to build a wall around their heart. The greatest challenge any man can do, ha succeed at, I think, for this part of the story, is to be man enough to walk through those flames and find and create a safe environment where the woman might express the beauty of who and what she is. And we find all of that happening right there. Most people will look at it and say, oh, he found something beautiful there. But there's something very deep and very wise about what's happening here. She comes from a time before. What bit through the Bernie? How was broken my sleep? Who made me free of the fetters pale? And that's the realization that a lot of women have when they come across someone they can truly love. How risky it is to love someone. How risky it is to expose your heart and the beauty of who you are to someone who won't value it, who may pretend to value it, or who may consider another bauble in their treasure chest to mark on their bedpost. What a wonderful thing to find yourself in a situation where you can look across and see that wonderful aspect of love. There's something truly beautiful happening here. This man, Sigurd, has gone through trial and error. He has avenged his father's death. He has slain the dragon on behalf of someone else. He has taken that red pill, so it is. He has stepped up to the plate, embraced the courage. He could have married a king's daughter, remember? He had all that gold. But he was such a quality of man that his horse carried him and the treasure, as if he were as valuable as the treasure, to this hall. And the first thing he does is be man enough to allow a woman to express the beauty of who she is. 
there's a lot of risk in that in today's world where a woman has no idea of what that might mean. Sigurd, he answered, Sigmund's son with Sigurd's sword that late the flesh hath fed the ravens. Sigurd sat beside her and asked her her name. She took a horn full of mead and gave him a memory drop. So the first thing that happens is the same thing that happens in the Rig's Thula. After the couple invite the divine into their home and they have a son, they bring to him a bride. And in all three generations, with the great grandmother and grandfather, with the grandmother and grandfather, and with the mother and father, they prepare, the son is presented with the bride and they spend all day talking and preparing the bed. There's something holy taking place in this action here. And we get, an, we get a glimpse of what that really is when, we, when Sigurd sits beside her, asks her name. She grabs a horn full of mead and gives him a memory drop. There is an amazing new world that is exposed to all of our senses when we begin to operate with a sense of love and connection to the partner with which we are sitting with. It's repeated again and again in the Rig Thula as the foundational aspect of creating and bringing children into this world that can fashion a society where people might thrive. In this story, it is a prayer. It is an expose, if you will, on the ancient wisdom of the time before which she is a remnant of. It is the completing of the competing complementary forces. Hail the day, hail the sons of day and night and her daughter now. Look on us here with loving eyes that waiting we victory win. So she's asking the sun and the moon and the, and the night and her daughter now, look on them with loving eyes. Not asking for anything, just look on us with loving eyes. Shine your light on this beautiful thing. We will... We will spend the time preparing the bed and waiting. We will victory win. It's the same thing that happens in the Riggs Thula. Hail to the gods, ye goddesses, hail, and all the generous earth. Hail to the gods, ye goddesses, hail. So right there, the gods and the goddesses, the divine, the masculine and feminine are called. They are hailed. They are called upon. And all the generous earth, every great, good, wonderful, wealth, treasure, beautiful thing emanates from this earth. We walk on it every, you, all the food we eat, all the treasures we have, everything that we live in, all of it comes from the earth. And it's generous beyond our imaginations. Give to us wisdom and goodly speech and healing hands lifelong. Not treasure, not love, not some kind of forbidden fantasy. Give to us wisdom. Give to us goodly speech and healing hands lifelong, that our touch might be something worth enjoying. A hug, a handshake, a pat on the back. Those kinds of connections between people, that limbic resonance that's so vital to understanding how to deal with other people. The wisdom and goodly speech are all a wonderful part of that. But now she goes into where she comes from. Long did I sleep, my slumber was long, and long are the griefs of life. Odin decreed that I could not break the heavy spells of sleep. So Sigurd, Sigurd, Brunhilde made a decision that her father didn't like. In an effort to make sure that those things that he valued and not what she valued, she was pricked with a sleep thorn. She was put to sleep until the man that was worthy to wake her up might be there. Thought the relationship between a father and a daughter is one of the most beautiful things that can ever happen if it's done properly. But when a father has a short-sighted limitation, he will, he will do more to ensure that the relationships she has in the future are bad than about any other aspect of what she, of what she encounters, far more than even what her mother does. How many times have you seen someone talk about some young lady that has daddy issues? Ah, it's almost as bad as a mama's boy. But those daddy issues are the kinds of things that help build that foundation to keep everyone out. 
not only does it keep everyone out, it prevents the women of this world from expressing the beauty of who they are. So now all of a sudden they're feminists and they're trying to wear jeans and boots and work like men. What? That's a great failing on the part of men. <laughs> Her name was Sigdrifa and she was a Valkyrie. She said that two kings fought in battle. One was called Hjalmar Gunnar, an old man, but a mighty warrior, and Odin had promised him the victory. And the other was Agnar, brother of Altha. None he found who fain would shield him. Sigdrifa slew Hjalgamar on the battlefield, and Odin pricked her with the sleep thorn in punishment for this, and said that she should never thereafter win victory in battle, that she should be wedded. And I said to him that I made a vow in my turn, and that I would never marry a man who knew the meaning of fear. Sigrith answered and asked her to teach him wisdom if she knew of what took place in all the worlds. So, what she's looking for is a man that has the courage to accept her for who she is. Odin's going to play her own strengths against her. He's going to do the same kind of thing that Reagan was doing with, with uh, Sigurd. But finding that he can't, she's too wild on her own. She's got her own mind. She's got her own thought process. He kind of poisoned the well for a little bit. But being that she was that powerful female, divine, feminine, she said, well, if you want me to be married, I'm not going to marry anyone that knows fear. So finally, a man does come along, a man that has what it takes to walk through the fire, a man who has slain the dragons of his life, which most men, if they don't enter into that warrior aspect or stage of living, they never figure out what those dragons even are. And that's, and that's something else, too, with the man-making ceremonies of, our, of ancient societies is those men figured out what their weaknesses were. They were faced with the weaknesses that they had and what they needed to do to overcome them. They had to compete. They had to thrive. They had to measure up to the other men of the tribe so that it became something strong and worth enjoying. Um, as time passes, we've kind of let that slide. Well, if you've got a college education, you can have this $100,000 a year job. Doesn't matter if you get drunk every weekend and beat your wife. Um, we're going to call you a man, and we'll, we'll understand. We'll drink one with you, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but Sigurd, Brunhilde understood it. Sigdrifa said, Beer I bring thee, tree of battle, mingle of strength and mighty of fame, charms it holds and healing signs, spells full good and gladness runes. That's a happy life for a strong man. The tree of battle. He, is, he has stood the test of time. He has mingled of strength and mighty fame, charms he holds and healing signs, spells full good and gladness runes. The, the lives of the brave and noble are best. Silent and wise shall the prince shall, the prince shall go. That's right out of the Havamal. So the divine feminine brings him that thing based upon his accomplishments in battle, his strength and his fame. She brings him the charms, the healing signs, the spells full of good and happiness. And that's something I don't think many of us dare to hope for is being, is having that moment to be happy. When does the average man get a chance to be happy and also true? When does he get to sit down and not be constantly agitated because some person decides to sleep with someone of another race agitated to the point they got to make a flyer of it. Do you think that his partner brought him charms full good and healing signs? Were there gladness runes involved in that? No, there's a poison in that. Well, winning runes learn if thou longest to win and the runes on thy sword hilt, right? Some on the furrow and some on the flat, and twice shall thou call on tear. Call on tear to win in the battle. Ail runes learn that with lies the wife of another betray not thy trust. That's the, the deceivers of men's wives. You do not use beer to seduce another man's wife. There's a special place in misty hell for those men that do that, the breakers of oaths. That's the other part of it. But the winning runes on the sword, when you go to fight a battle, when you go to accept a challenge, um, when they say call twice shalt thou call on tear, not just once, but twice. Oh, there he is. There's my boy. What's up, man? 
on the horn shall write in the backs of thy hands, and need shall mark on thy nails. Go ahead and hit mute on your mic, Darren. There we go. Thank you. On the horn shall write in the backs of thy hands. So, what are they writing on the horn in the back of their hands? The ale runes, alu, and need shall mark on thy nails. Now, this is a powerful rune, and I tell you, if you start thinking about it, you're going to start needing things. You're going to start needing things, but you're going to work on it. You're going to do those things necessary to keep moving forward. Thou shalt bless the draught and danger escape and cast a leak in the cup. The leak was supposed to absorb poisons. For so I know thou never shalt see thy mead with evil mixed. The leak was, uh, uh, that's when the field after Ragnarok, the leak's all green with the sun's, sun's dew and they're supposed to absorb poison. Um, it just looks like a big onion to me, but I guess it's important. Hmm. Hmm. Birth runes learn if thou wilt lend the babe from the mother to bring. On thy palm shall write them and round thy joints and ask the fates to aid. So she's, she's talking about some very important things here that we're not paying attention to. Birth runes on the baby. Write them on their palms, write them around their joints and ask the fates to aid. So she's, when you write these runes, these birth runes, Burkano on their palms and around their joints, there's something special that that's an incorporation of an individual into the environment around them that very much incorporates them into those divine energies that flow across the surface of the world. Whenever some culture would settle into an area, the first thing they would do is incorporate the most religious aspects, the most holy ideas of who and what they were into the environment around them. They would line things up with the sun. They would have a solstitial alignment. They would have with the stars, with the rising and setting of the sun, with the rising and setting of the moon. They would incorporate the fields, what crops to grow, how the water would flow, all of that stuff. When a baby is born, and brought into this world, we all do the naming ceremony. But when we start talking about putting these runes on a child, now we're talking about a whole nother thing here. And I think that might be something we need to start looking at with regards to our children. Wave runes learn if thou, if well that would shelter the sail steeds out of the storm. If you're gonna travel across the sea, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. How important would it be for someone to know that if they could put wave runes on a ship, they might know. That speaks specifically to that storm where Reagan was cowering in his boots and Odin appeared the man on the mountain to calm that sea and went sailing with him and imparted all of that very important wisdom to him. On the stem shalt thou write in the steering blade and burn them into the oars. Though high be the breakers and black the waves, thou shalt safe the harbor seek. She's, as we look at this, she's really teaching him that's a very powerful thing to be able to have a ship that you don't have to fear the sea. That gives you the opportunity to travel all kinds of unseen horizons. That gives you the opportunity to feel confident even, huh? Maybe a little bit more brave than the next man. Branch runes learn if a healer which to be and cure for the wounds which to work. On the bark shalt thou write, and on trees that be, with bows to the eastward bent. Now we're talking about being a healer. Now we're talking about, and the aspirin comes from the bark of a willow. So the branch runes, you know, there's a lot of stuff that involved with that. These certain leaves, these pulses, all of this natural healer. Runes cut in the bark of trees. Such runes were believed to transfer sickness from the invalid to the tree. Some have changed it from, some other editors change it from branch runes to life runes. So it's kind of tossed up, but it's one of those things that as we move forward in this faith, it might behoove us to begin to understand. Speech runes learn that none may seek to answer harm with hate. So we gotta learn how to talk to people. There's a lot of things happening in this world that might harm our future. There's a lot of things going on in this world. If we spend all of our time focusing on how much we hate this or that, it's going to have negative consequences on our future, as we have just witnessed. Well, he winds and weaves them all and sets them side by side. At the judgment place, when justice there, the folk shall fairly win. Get your ducks in a row. 
Anytime I see a, a guy that's in trouble with the law, usually been in trouble with the law before, he starts talking about, I'm going to call on Tyr to win in this legal case. Well, first of all, Tyr is this god of combat, as we just saw in that first stanza. Uh, it is, it's what, it's Forsetti and Balder. They're the ones that offer the most sound judgments. But this also tells us that if we're the kind of person that's doing the right thing to begin with, we're probably not going to find ourselves in those kinds of situations. So if we're walking around using also true as this excuse to continue acting an ass in the world, well, that's the problem. We're not going to have our ducks in a row when it's time to go to the judgment place. We're not going to fairly win. There's a certain way to act and a certain way not to act in every aspect of our society, in every tribe, village, city, community, nation, or household. If we're not going to do that, these speech runes that we learn, well, the first thing we're going to learn is that those things that are that people are talking about, like Reagan egging him on to kill Fafner, it really doesn't have anything to do with this. Who cares if I'm sitting here trying to perceive how much I dislike that? Not many people. Thought runes learn, if, sh if all shall think, thou art keenest minded of men. We gotta learn how to think. Our thought process creates our reality. If we're sitting here focusing on the negative, if we're sitting here focusing on how much we hate this or hate that, if we're sitting here focusing on some wrong in the world or starving children in Africa or our neighbors doing this or black people get away with this or Asian people get away with that. If we're sitting here thinking about all of those things, tell me, when are we thinking about moving ourselves forward? When are we thinking about creating a household where our children might grow up happy? When are we creating an environment where we're not going to attempt to put those poisons into our child's head that they might grow up and be far more successful than we ever could be? That's the lesson of the Riggs Thula. Every one of those generations, the grandchildren of the great grandmother, grandfather, and, and mother and father, they all bear names that are important aspects of, at the beginning, building the society, at the end, being the valuable aspects, the culmination, the gifts of a successful society. Our thought process is what helps determine how that shapes up. If we want to appear to be the keenest minded of men, our thought process needs to be focused on, how does this help me build my faith in also true? And that's the one question I very rarely see asked. I see all kinds of people trying to make a determination of, well, the quality of Brian Wilton's Austria may not necessarily be as, he's kind of folkish light. He's not really that important. And what's, what's your source on all that? Um, and then we have, you know, which way a Western man or any or blah, 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 blah. Tell me how any of that stuff that's being talked about helps me build my faith in also true and create an environment where my grandchildren can grow up and enjoy a world of success of their own. Then Harope arranged, and them he wrote, and them in thought he made. He arranged them, Harope is Odin. And then he made out of drought that down had dropped from the head of Hyth Dropnir and the horn of Hod, Hod Hodrofnir. On the mountain he stood with Bremir's sword, on his head the helm he bore. Then first the head of Mim spoke forth and the words of truth it told. So there's a whole preparation here. The Hyth Dropnir is light dropper and Hrobnir is treasure opener. And, they seem, and it says here that they're supposed to be names for Mim. But it, this is about the head of men, but this is how we arrange our thought. This is wisdom. So the light dropper, the treasure opener, when we want to shine the light on the bright future that we want, we do so with wisdom and the culmination of a positive thought process. Matter of fact, an August thought process that yields a true nautical standard. That's what we need to be working on with regards to building this faith. And that is, man, that's why we started all this to begin with. He bade right on the shield before the shining goddess, and on Arvok's ear, and on Elizabeth's hoof, on the wheel of the car of Rungnir's killer, on Sleipner's teeth, and the straps of the sledge. Okay, that, that's kind of in, um, Rhaenyra is a giant. 
and why Odin should have the sword, that's really not known. But as he creates that thought process, he tells us where to put these, and these all represent certain aspects of what it is. Sleipnir's teeth, Sleipnir is that eight-legged horse that more often than not represents the eight legs of the four men that carried a man to his funeral pyre. That's your escort to the afterworld. There's a hidden knowledge in that. And when you cross that boundary, when you are in that process, that escort, um, there's a lot of knowledge that comes with that. And we'll get into that when we talk about the death of Balder, when uh, Hoder rides Sleipnir into hell. That is, there's some interesting parts there that talk about our afterlife that are not discussed, that we need to start taking more important understanding of. That journey covers more of what it means for us to pass into the next world than just about anything else. We, we, we carve them on Arvac's ear at Alvith's hooth. Alvith is all swift. Arvac is early waker, so we're going to get up early and we're going to get at it. On the wheel of the car of Rungnir's killer. That's the slayer of the giant Hungnir, but that's Thor. So that's the wheel of the car. That's the warder. That's the protector of men. <laughs> on the paws of the bear and on Bragi's tongue. Now the Basque in France, they always say that the bear is the brother of man. Not the ape, we didn't come out of trees, but the bear, the, the bear was before the onset of Christianity, the holy symbol for Europe. That was the powerful animal. That was the apex predator for all of Europe until Christianity and Roman influence slowly supplanted that with the lion. But it was the bear that was the most important aspect. I mean, you come across a bear, you're pretty much screwed, unless you had a spear, which is why Odin has a spear. Um, on the wolf's claw bared and the eagle's beak, on bloody wings and bridges end, on freeing hands and helping footprints, on glass and on gold and on goodly charms, in wine and in beer and on well-loved seat, on Gungnir's point and on granny's breast, on the nails of norns and the night owl's beak. The wisdom of this is that we should incorporate just about every aspect of our being and the runes. This is how we incorporate ourselves into the divine aspects of everything around us, of the world we live in, of the next world, of the animals that are, they all represent something on glass and on gold, uh, on what we see through and what we value, on the eagle's beak, the great catcher of fish, on bloody wings, that's the, that's the, what they call that, the blood eagle, the slaying of our enemies, and the bridge's end, on freeing hands and helping footprints. All of those things are part of life with regards to how, of people in that age. And with but a small amount of imagination, with about a small amount or application of a, of a positive thought process, we can see how we might best take those same ideas and incorporate the divine, this faith, into everything that we do. And that's part of it. Everything we do, our thought process, should be centered around how does this help me build a good, successful life? No one is offered a suggestion of what it might look like to live an austere life. What should we expect? Should we expect constant agitation? Should we continually expect that we need to give a 30-minute dissertation about how we might be able to outthink anyone because we, well, we really understand about what's happening and who really runs the world and so on and so forth. That has nothing to do with me building a successful, also true life. But if I take those ideas and just those two stanzas and begin to incorporate ideas of the runes into everything I do, now all of a sudden, every aspect of my life might change. When I begin to engage the world in a, in a positive thought process of a confident man or an empowered feminine divine, now all of a sudden those new horizons that we caught a glimpse of when we came in also true, well, they become a reality. They become a little bit closer. We become a little bit more. That's the beauty of also true. Not that we've figured something out, but all of those wonderful horizons that we thought we might become, now we are told how we might achieve them. And it starts with our thought process.
having the courage to step away from all of those negative things we were taught or told to value and begin to embrace the world we live in. I'm going to stop right there because we've been at it for an hour. And uh, we'll pick up again next week in the Sig Griffamol in 18. Um, and it continues on with the runes and it continues on in that same light. But I appreciate everybody joining me tonight. And I think, I think Melissa, you and Everett, we're going to stay on here for a second. Yes, that'd be correct. Hey, okay. Brian. Hey. Hey, Brian. Sorry I was late. It's Our okay, man. I appreciate it. I my, uh, Darren's my boy. I tickle Pinky. Join me. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Darren. Nice to meet you. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come get you. I'm going to get up about 6, and I'll come get you in the morning, okay? All right, that way I'll be ready. All right, love you some. I'll talk to you later. All right, love you too. Bye. Bye. The rest of y'all have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. No problem. What do you got going after this, uh, Melissa? We got some business to attend to. Mm, okay. All righty, y'all. I'm out of here. It's raining like cats and dogs over here in Arkansas. So you be careful, buddy. Right, I will be. Later, hey. bud. Bye. Bye. Have a, have a good afternoon, evening, whatever it is for you. Um, about that mindset, Brian. Um, the new job I got right now, that is behind every single thing they say. Having that constructive, positive mindset to build their future, and they've got a lot of successful people. So. Dude, that's a whole – Anybody that's ever been successful is going to tell you that. The next part of it is creating a measurable standard of success. Yeah. I highly encourage you to pay attention to Daniel Pena. I, uh, I'll be looking at that. There's a Ian He's got some good wise words about uh, mindset and stuff too, but I'm going to let you guys get through it. Okay, and, man. Uh, as always, a pleasure, Brian. Thank you, man. I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. See you, Jason. In, in like two seconds. <laughs> all right you turn the recording off oh nope of course not why would i do that <laughs>